Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Season 2 of the ESG Experience Podcast brought to you by Conservus ESG. I'm Healy Lev, Conservus ESG's Chief Revenue Officer, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes into the ESG universe to understand how it could help with engaging stakeholders, mitigating risks, and attracting investors, this podcast is for you. Together, we will navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, discuss ideas, review strategies, and share industry news and trends. In today's episode, actually quite excited about it, um, title of today's episode, Trash Talk. Uh, If that doesn't speak for itself, I don't know what does. But um, we're not here to just uh, slander others, if that's what you're thinking when, when I say trash talk. We are going to explore the complexity of waste, waste reporting as it relates to ESG, and take a look at new emerging technologies. Um, Despite the amount of trash talk we'll be doing, uh, so yes, no feelings will be harmed or hurt in the making of this episode. I don't know, unless I I tell Adam that his pet is ugly or something, it could happen. Might be warranted, though. (laughs) And uh, for this very special episode, we are joined by three esteemed guests who are true specialists in their area of expertise. Um, All of my coworkers, proud to say, Dax Madsen, Heidi Senvig, and Adam Stravinkas. Um, Dax has been with Conservus since 2010, 12 years. Wow, congrats. That's, uh, that's big these days. Um, Thank and you. has served in capacities. Yeah, uh, that's no joke. I, I feel like nowadays the, the tenure um, in, the, in the Great Resignation era is like uh, 10 months. So, you know, 12 years. Um, so in his 12 years with Conservus, has responsibilities um, as far as the director of WasteX, Conservus's Waste and Recycling Management Solution. Additionally, DAX has helped with sustainability support efforts for our clients within the energy analytics, benchmark reporting, coordination of outside counsel for Conservus. DAX has a bachelor's degree from Utah State University in economics. And if you can't get a hold of DAX, he's probably running around the trails of Logan, Utah, which um, I've dipped a a pinky toenail, but are actually beautiful, and I look forward to exploring um, in more depth. So welcome, DAX. Happy to have you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, next, so Heidi, um, new to Conservus ESG, she is an ESG consultant providing clients with GHG inventory and reporting support. Um, been with Conservus since March, is in one month, but was uh, brave enough to join us and share her expertise on is, is your inaugural podcast. Yeah, never done it before. Mm-hmm. Okay. She is from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, but she tries not to make that fact her entire personality. <laughs> nice. Um, We'll let you unpack that for us. Uh, Heidi holds a bachelor's degree from Michigan State University in chemical engineering. So how might being from the uh, UP of Michigan uh, embody one's entire personality? Well, I think there's a stereotype about how people from the Upper Peninsula are. Um, You either have the earthy, crunchy people or a little redneck. Um, And I didn't want to – I'm trying to think of – how to explain my background without mentioning it, but it felt impossible. So, so. you're either granola or you're redneck. Can you be anything in between or totally different? Or well, I that... try to fit okay. in that space um, if people will let me. So um, hopefully I can convince people that I am neither of those. Maybe a little bit in between, but... All right. Well, TBD, because I've known you for about two weeks, but um, we'll decide. Um, and last but not least, Adam is Conservus ESG's Sales Enablement Manager. In his role, he uses a holistic approach to ESG to align internal stakeholders, identify the best ways to support Conservus ESG clients. Um, additionally, he has worked on regenerative farms and is an avid freegan, once having gone nearly two years without buying groceries. He writes about it in his blog, um, shameless plug, freddyfreegan.com. Um, so, Adam, I've heard uh, what your story, and I know all about what a freegan is and freeganism because of you, and I've talked about it in my comings and goings, but do enlighten our tens of thousands of listeners um, what is what is a freegan. So, in high, like from a high level, I think of freeganism as basically living off of waste, which is food waste, like food or um, just like stuff that's going to waste, whether it's like furniture or random things. Um, So, yeah, I, um, in short, I kind of got into this while backpacking years ago, but I started finding food in, like, travel budget hostels with communal kitchens. People would leave food behind, free food, and um, it was just available for whoever wanted it. So 
started finding a lot of free food that way. Um, it was like the funnest thing ever. We would just, you know, like I was in Dublin, Ireland and didn't buy food for four days. And I was like, this is the coolest, the funnest thing ever. <laughs> um, and so then got back to the U.S. Was pretty, pretty sad that I wasn't going to be in uh, hostels anymore, but I started to like dumpster dive and um, so it is true, you eat garbage. I mean, you know, <laughs> gar- I guess, you know, however you want to label that like one that man's food, trash is another exactly, man's treasure. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, think yeah. of it that way. Cause yeah. I don't want it, like, to get too far out into the world that Adam eats garbage or anything yeah. like that. But, um, no, but that's super cool. Yeah. Seriously, super cool. And you still blog about it for those who want to learn more, try it, try it, have a, have a um, crack at it. Yeah, I have, like, tips and funny stories and just like philosophical musings on my blog, but trying to just, uh, yeah, help people, um, do it themselves if they want to. And, and it's all in the yeah. name of sustainability, ESG. That's right. Right. That's right. That's like what motivates it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a, there's a, it's obviously, um, sustainable, but then also it's just like fun. Financially. Financially also, yeah. it's worth it, you know, so. Give me something to talk about on a first date. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So if um, I take food, uh, uh, in the kitchen from the, you know, if I, if I grab leftover food from the kitchen at the office, is that considered freeganism? I would say, yeah, I would say so. Um, I used to work in like a co-working space and the manager of the building there, like they had fridge cleanouts every Friday because so many people would just leave food over the weekend and, um, we were friends. So she, she used to just throw it in the trash and then she like, she would let me look through it beforehand. So, mm-hmm. It's not for everyone, but I feel like it. Overall, it's uh, it's fun for me, and I think it's just like doing a good thing. So I like it. Super cool. Um, all right. So what we hope to learn or unpack in this episode, and I'm gonna let the experts speak more than anything else. Um, waste is complex. It's multifaceted. It's not straightforward. Um, when you look at it through an environmental lens, there are different waste streams. Um, there are emerging regulations, which of course impact what we're doing here as an ESG company, um, attempting to do ESG reporting. Um, there exists a product around it, which is DAX's um, brainchild, if you will, WasteX. And um, we want to go through a little bit about just the learning experience of waste management awareness, because as these things go, everything begins with awareness. So I'll ask the group, um, you know, to our first objective, why, why is waste so complex? Well, I guess I'll, I'll start. I think um, I think it's complex because when you look at water and energy, you very much I think you're very much of you're much more aware of what you're consuming, and then as far as waste, you know, there's so many different waste streams, um, and you don't necessarily know where the waste goes. Um, my my dad always likes to say, "Where is a way?" You know, it just goes away somewhere. So. I think, I think. Yeah, that's still how you talk about it, right? I'm going to throw it away. Yeah. That's literally what you say. But where is a way, right? Yeah, it's yeah. got to go that's somewhere. Good. So it's, con- I think it's just complex too, because some waste, you know, it, let, let's call it straight trash. Some can be recycled. Some can be, you know, composted or reused into something new. So it's not, it's not necessarily like a one size fits all. I would also say that products today aren't necessarily always created considering their end life. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't consider what happens to the product after we've developed it. So nothing, I mean, there's not a lot of products out there that are designed for the end life. There's yeah, not a lot of consideration that goes there. Such a great point. I think another thing that also makes it complex is all of the, the different rules and regulations around it, right? For example, in the state of California, um, we know they have SB 1383, which is, has been awesome, very fascinating to see. But depending on what city you're in, it's completely different. So although the state of California has one set of rules, it really depends on the, you know, the individual city or county. And so I think it also becomes difficult when you're, you're looking at what are the actual regulations in my area um, and just how frequently that changes also adds to a lot of the complexity of it. I'll add to just from my observations experience, and I don't, um, I'm not a self-proclaimed waste expert, but I think so much of waste management, responsible waste management is dependent upon behavioral 
you know, just be just the behavior of individuals. So something like energy, you know, you could retrofit light bulbs and have more control over that, or you could control the, you know, the source of energy if you're sourcing renewables. Even water use, you can put aerators. You can kind of, um, you have like a single choke point to control those things. Waste is totally dependent on, you know, the a-hole that wants to put a plastic bottle in the trash can when there's a recycling bin right there, or the people that, you know, it, it's it's really dependent on each individual putting their trash away. And then, of course, um, the other component, so I find myself sometimes when I'm traveling most recently to, like, I suppose not even that remote of an area of Florida um, was still populated, but just didn't recycle there. Like, there was just no um, infrastructure to take it. So, as I do, I was... Um, separating the glass jars and the plastic bottles and, you know, that kind of thing. But it was so terrible. There was nowhere. It had to all just go back in the trash can. It felt like a terrible thing to do. But no matter my behavior, the infrastructure wasn't there to support even just the most basic recycling. So, um, yeah, I mean, from that standpoint, you think about the exercise of herding cats, if there ever was one, that feels like it. Yeah, that's definitely a, a very frustrating feeling. You're like, oh, yeah, you do all work. this work. And you then, put a glass jar in the trash. Like oh, it's, I'm just going to, yeah. PTSD about it. Yeah. <laughs> And and to to Dax's point too about um, California, I, I like I know for example in Chicago I I couldn't tell you the numbers offhand, but I know that a lot of what's you know supposedly goes in the recycle recycling isn't actually recycled, and then you know if you want to compost it's something that you have to individually pay for on your own, even though you know that stuff could be really valuable like repurposed into soil et cetera. So yeah, it, it's a uh, it, a lot of it does depend on where you live. I might be wrong, but I think about, I think it's nine percent of plastics um, that go into recycling bins are actually recycled. Oh God, that kills me. It's just terrible to know. Yeah, I mean it's a problem. We got to fix it and hope it doesn't come to um, you know the point of no return if we're not there already. But we didn't mean to get that depressing. Yeah. It was early in the podcast, <laughs> and we were this is still an upbeat podcast overall. Um, so. Recently, I think there's definitely an increased lens or focus on ESG in general, um, all aspects of ESG, specifically the S and G uh, within commercial real estate, the built environment where we work, where the past you know 10, 15 years has been heavy on the E. Um, what are emerging trends that you guys are seeing with regards to waste management? Yeah, so there have been a couple things that have happened uh, really just throughout 2022. Um, one of those we talked about SB 1383. Uh, California's recycling and composting. Uh, and then also recently, Washington's also signed in a new bill that they're calling for a 75% reduction in organic waste by 2030. So we're starting to see a lot of these cities and states throughout the country that are starting to recognize um, really where that there is a problem and they're starting to take action on how do we solve that. Now, how that gets implemented is um, obviously we to be seen, but it, it's pretty exciting to see that, you know, people are actually are taking action now. I think uh, what I've been seeing, I mean, it's hard on the state level, I mean, besides California, California manages to do a lot, but for most states, it's really hard to implement different strategies in regards to waste that everyone can agree with. Um, so it's actually really interesting to kind of see what's happening on a city level, um, where they have more control over what's um, going on in the municipality. Um, in 2017, when I lived in Traverse City, um, I was working at a restaurant there, and um, it was really cool to see what this, the city of Traverse City was doing, where all the restaurants in town were uh, participating with the composting uh, situation. So basically, all of the plastic that was being used in the restaurants, the straws, takeout cups, you know, plastic silverware, if, if used, um, was all um, like made out of like a sugar or something. So it's all compostable. Um, so not only in the restaurant, you know, taking people's food, you can just dump everything into the compost bin. But if you take a plastic cup uh, to go, you know, with your coffee or whatever, and you walk downtown, you can go shopping, and then there's a compost bin just waiting for you outside the store, just all down. Downtown. Well, they did think about the downstream too. Like yeah. where that cup goes once it leaves the restaurant. Yeah, so it's, it was just really cool to see. I've never seen that before, um, to kind of see what, what, you know, a city is kind of experimenting with and to see how it works. And, you know, I don't know what the current state of that is, um, but it's, um, you know, an interesting idea, you know, that other cities may be able to implement similar 
That is super cool. I would, yeah, I'd be curious to know if it got traction. And I think they've gotten better with some of those compostable products. Like I remember when they first had those paper straws where you were just like, this is gross. I can't, you know, I'd rather just not have a straw than use the paper straw. But I think they've gotten better with, you know, some of that stuff. But again, is it um, affordable, sustainable economically? Um, To your point, you have to have the compost bins available to even handle it. So there's a lot of thought that has to go into it. Um, I think it starts to, like, it starts small, small scale towns, cities scale up from there. But I mean, that's of course one approach. But I think, you know, we talk about one one person's trash is another person's treasure. Um, there's you know a lot of conversation around circular economy and where can you find value in that waste. And I think that's ultimately going to drive a lot of the newer innovation. Like there's clearly a, like there's a lot of waste, so that that means that there's clearly a lot of opportunity. Yeah. I agree. Um, What about like more unconventional, um, you know, things like paralysis? Paralysis is that how you say it? Paralysis. I know the word pyro means fire, so excited to hear about that. And biochar sounds also like um, sending something aflame. Um, What are what's the deal with those? Yeah. So on the industry level, um, I have uh, previously worked with a client who was looking. It was actually in the oil and gas sector, um, looking at pyrolysis. Um, and in this specific instance, they were looking at taking uh, recycled plastic um, and using pyrolysis, which is basically like an anaerobic um, combustion um, reactor, essentially. So it's you know without oxygen. Um, and is it still emitting carbon though, like from burning it? Yes, but um, and sometimes like yeah. So it is a carbon intensive process it, well in this case in this case with the with what this company was doing um, and they were looking at taking recycled plastic and um, turning it into or basically trash plastic and turning it into a virgin grade recycled plastic so right now when you have recycled plastic you're looking at what is just melted down it's kind of a mechanical process melted down and reformed um, but this is kind of looking at taking um, yeah, basically creating a circular economy around plastic. Um, with, uh, you know, when you're looking at plastic or just considering all the types of things that can be recycled anyway, like metal can pretty much be recycled endlessly, glass can be recycled endlessly, but when you're looking at plastic or even paper, each time you recycle it, the it becomes, it, it, it degrades. It's not, the, the product is not, as um it's not like one for one yeah, yeah it's not it's not 100 percent um reusable really and mm-hmm. uh, so this is kind of an idea um that i think is gaining traction you know to yeah to, to basically you know i guess in a way keep the plastic industry going because um you know i think they're in a lot of hot water right now especially oil and gas it, it also kind of creates a like an em- economic um like escape route, I think, for oil and gas. You know, mm-hmm. as as you know, the world has to rely less on fossil fuels. You know, they have like an, a way to keep themselves in business um, by looking at recycling. So I think it's kind of an interesting an interesting thing that's happening out there. You know, there might be you know it might be a carbon intensive process. You know, there's a trade off there. Is it is it really what we need right now? You know, considering we're trying to reduce our carbon emissions, that's a big part of ESG. Um, so it's just you know something to think about, something that's happening. Um, yeah. And on the on more of like a so last summer I, I worked on a couple farms and on one of those farms this guy had a he was it was more of an experimental biochar kiln. And basically, what it would be is two chambers. So in the bottom chamber, you're burning essentially like dead wood or trees, or you can really kind of any any organic matter and normally when a tree falls and decomposes 90 like three percent of that carbon is being absorbed back into the ground and then 97 percent of it is going up into the atmosphere so oh wow even just from a dead tree yeah so as the tree grows it's taking carbon and then as it when it dies it's kind of like giving it back up Mm -hmm. so this is like any trees that are down or you know it's like peanut shells like i can't think of uh, some great examples, but like Heidi was saying, you can take mostly anything, and then you're you're baking it. So 
you, you need a fire to get going, like a combustion fire, but then it's burning without oxygen. Um, and in this case, like the container is closed, so no gas is really escaping and all the carbon um, is basically captured into biochar, which is basically something that's similar to carbon. And then in farming, um, it's used as something that you would add to your fields to uh -huh. hold on to more nutrients or hold on to more water. So, you know, it helps with drought resistance, um, just be uh, better tasting so food. So there's a byproduct of this that you can then use for the crop. Yeah, the byproduct is essentially carbon. So there have been some estimates that where this could, like done in mass, it could, this sounds crazy, but between 10 to like 60% of CO2 emissions that it could potentially capture. Wow. Yeah. Which would be uh, amazing, and it's free and easy. It's just literally about leading a behavioral change that just seems like a huge undertaking. Yeah, and it's it's just not as common, and it just needs to become more of like a widespread, scalable yeah. practice. So it's it's definitely something that that's really exciting. I think it's interesting how there's like two sides with the pyrolysis. You know, there's the side that it is you know, helping reduce carbon emissions and the side where it potentially is creating more carbon emissions. I think it has to do with the speed of the process, um, you know, based on how quickly you heat the material and um, are combusting it, basically, then it, you get a different product. So either the the, uh, the naphtha or the oil uh, that you're trying to get for the pyrolysis for recycled plastics um, is, is more carbon intensive, but what... Uh, what Adam was talking about is, um, yeah, less emissions, more of it turning into like a solid matter. Um, so it's, yeah. it's interesting the kind of chemistry. <laughs> yeah, there's tons of tons of research and companies popping up trying to solve it or you know make it better. Um, no, that makes sense. All right, so earlier in the podcast, we piqued the listeners' interest about the fact that Adam, the rumor that Adam may or may not eat garbage. I think we cleared the air on that a little bit. Um, so tell us, so what do we mean by offense versus defense with regards to dumpster diving? Is this a sport? Is dumpster diving a sport? <laughs> well, to some people it might be, but I think of offense and defense as, so offense would be finding the food, right, whether that's dumpster diving or, you know, my roommate used to work in events and he would get food all the time. Um, you can, people will like post things on Craigslist. There's a number of different ways that you can, you can find food. And that's more offensive because you're proactively having to go look for the food. Yeah, you're, you're okay. getting the food. And then defense is more about saving the food. So I would say that's like eating leftovers or I can just yeah. do the same thing over like days on end yeah, yeah, yeah. or like keeping track of what you have and then prioritizing what's going to go bad first. Um, and eating that stuff, like I just make Buddha bowls. It's like all all I really eat, mm -hmm. and um, so it's like those kind of things that go that will go like hand in hand towards like keeping your supply. What's the stat? I remember seeing it on a billboard just driving on 94. It's something like only 15. It's either you, only 15% of food that you buy from the grocery store actually gets eaten, or it's the 15% that gets thrown away. And I can't remember which is which. I want to say almost like. There's like 40% of food is wasted in it's the U.S. Completely it's completely thrown away, yeah, crazy. yeah, yeah. And that. you think about that, you know, you go to the grocery store, you're like, I, I really want to get into asparagus, it's good for me, I'm doing it. You buy it, and then it, you know, it rots in your fridge, and then you throw it away a week later. Like, you tell your mother-in-law, like, yeah, I'll take those leftovers, I don't really want them. But then, like, again, same story, they're molded, two weeks later you throw them out. There has to just be so much of that. Yeah. Yeah. And again, behavioral, right? Like, right. that's totally up to people and humans, like you said, prioritize, eat the stuff that's going to spoil suck it up, eat the same leftovers several days in a row. It's sustenance, it's food. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, you know, restaurants, grocery stores, even farms, you know, have stuff that they they can't. So it's, again, like going back to waste being multifaceted, there's so many different avenues to, to try to tackle. Wasn't that so, also the business? I think you worked there for a bit. Oh, sorry, Dex. Um, I was going to ask, Adam had a stint at Imperfect Produce or Imperfect Foods, right? Yeah. So they, a great thought. Yeah, they essentially took um, food from farms that was kind of like grade B stuff that was misshapen or surplus or too small, too big. So totally edible, just unsightly. Yeah. And then they delivered that to people's homes um, so that, you know, basically people can bite food waste as they eat. Love it. Yeah. Sorry, Dex, uh, you were saying something. No, you're good. So Adam, I think this is fascinating, the adventure that you've gone on. Um, what, so for someone like myself, I've never 
gone on this adventure. Um, what's something you've learned that we could, you know, the everyday listener could apply to their life? What, what's something that I can be teaching my kids? Okay. Ooh, those are, I think those are two different questions. So I think I got, I got two answers for you. So one, I think one thing that I've learned or come to realize is, you know, the instinct is, oh, that's really gross, right? A lot of what's actually in the trash is already wrapped in plastic, right? Like we have a kind of plastic problem. And so a lot of this stuff isn't like truly contaminated. Like that's kind of a benefit for a dumpster diver because it's not really contaminated. Um, it's just getting over like the mental block of like, I took this thing from the trash, like from the garbage. Yeah. Like when you're saying it's clean, right. it's sanitary, it's, in the, it's wrapped. Right. Yeah. If it's, if it like looks or smells bad, like I definitely won't eat it. Yeah. Um, Have you ever gotten sick? No. I mean, no. I, I, I had Buffalo Wild Wings <laughs> once, but that was just, I should not have had that. <laughs> well, that can happen <laughs> anyways. You can have like bad Thai food that's fresh yeah. from the table at a restaurant and still get sick. Right. Yeah. And then I guess as far as thought to teach your kids, I mean, I guess my biggest takeaway is always just trying to appreciate what you have because at the end of the day, you know, you can make so much use of, of what you have and, um, I don't know, I think this is going way deep, but I think appreciation is probably the key to happiness. So something something like that you could part part wisdom on to the youth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's cool, awesome. you know, Adam, like not obviously not everyone can do that. Um but I think like what was really interesting to learn from it is what you do is that there is like we it exposes how much is going in the trash that you were able to live for two years completely off of the contents yeah. of some garbage bin. Like that exposes such a big problem in our society. And I really think, yeah, and, you know, kind of living off the way, like, okay, well, I have these ingredients based on what I got here. You know, what can I make with that? And I think, you know, I think, you know, teaching your kids especially, it's like, okay, what do we have in the fridge? What can we, what can we creatively make out of what we have instead of constantly buying more ingredients and potentially letting what you do have go to waste, um, preventing creating more trash in the process. So yeah. I think um, it's a you know, really a cool story that you have there. Yeah, everyone can play defense, right? So a lot of a lot of strategies for everyone, even if you don't want a dumpster dive. <laughs> I don't, personally. <laughs> um, I like the idea, though, you know, of just talking about, so it kind of ties in with item six here, you know, changing the mindset of out of sight, out of mind, or thinking about what do you mean when you say throw it away? And then I do relate that back to having small children. I mean, there's no concept of, like, it's actually fun to ask them. I have before. When you throw something in the garbage, like, just, like, where does it go? And just watch their little heads try to think and process, yeah. like, they know a garbage truck comes. Um, they don't really think beyond that. So then it's, like, again, behavioral thing, instilling those values and that behavior in them at a young age. And I remember when I was growing up, um, Earth Day, like, had just kind of come about. Like, it was, they were teaching it in the curriculum. It was something that really stuck with me. It essentially, you could say, planted the seeds for my career later in ESG. But it's just starting young. And it was just, with the Earth Day stuff, it was just the concept of, like, recycle. This is your responsibility. This is our planet. You take care of it. Um, we planted trees every year. Just things like that that just start becoming part of, you know, your everyday behavior. But, God, yeah, it starts with a two-year-old, a three-year-old. Um, and just teaching them the right way. And the other thing I'll say, you know, for looking at that standpoint, it is so wasteful. I just did a nice spring cleaning over the weekend. The amount of just like plastic toys and garbage and like to Heidi's point of like no one is thinking, and even if they are thinking, they don't give an F about the end of life of that stuff. They're manufacturing cheap crap from overseas. They're shipping it a bajillion miles across the ocean to put a cheap plastic piece of crap in a goodie bag for a birthday party that I then six months later am cleaning out my house being like, this is garbage and it's irresponsible. It's absolutely irresponsible. It's disgusting. It's a disgusting habit. And I feel like, um, I hope that 20 years from now we look back and we're like, remember, like the way that now we'll look back and be like, how gross is it that people used to smoke on airplanes? What a crazy, disgusting idea. Like, I hope that that's us in 20 years about plastic cheap crap that like you just give to kids as if there's no limits and no implications because it's terrible and speech i love it <laughs> feeling the passion yeah. Yeah. so we yeah. skipped around but um let's hit this one so pure waste versus repurposing i think that's an interesting um delineation to make who wants it go for it adam 
I can see you you want to jump in on this one. Well, I, I'm still uh, I'm still absorbing Healy's. Uh... My rant. <laughs> no, I, 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 There's I really. More where that came from. I really like loved it. I, I just I just think the sort of way that kids are figuring out, okay, where does this go? And I, I love that attitude and idea of we're going to have things like we're going to have these mindset changes and sort of um, program technology, whatever you want to call it, changes where yeah, kids are going to start knowing this better than we are and and we're just slowly going to improve. Um, and, and also I wanted to comment on your last point about just with no regard to the to the end product. I think that's why um, scope three emissions are so important to you know keep track of to really really know what your impact is um, at, at the end of the life cycle. I think as far as pure waste goes, um, a little bit like what I was saying earlier, you know, a lot of waste could be value. Not everything is just trash away type of stuff, right? So um, how do we, how can we just within our own community find those connections where we can make use of what's going to waste or, um, you know, we can influence our local politics, um, make an impact at our companies, et cetera. Um, even like, I'll give another example of this farm that I was at, they would, similar to Traverse City, they would take the compost from this juice bar and it smelled absolutely terrible, but we would make our own compost. And so that was, and then they would um, get some food from the farm in exchange. So it's kind of like uh, a sort of system where the incentives work for everyone and everyone is a driving value. That actually reminds me, um, uh, I used to work on my family's farm and uh, my uncle was part of this um, co-op where um, in order to keep the prices high, um, a lot of the product had to just be thrown away so that, um, yeah, so that there was, I don't know, less product. I don't really understand the full reasons of that, but a lot of it had to be thrown I away. I remember learning about this too, yeah. 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 And, because um, you want to keep the supply limited because if there's a surplus of supply, it's going to drive the prices down. Yeah. Like who majored in economics? Wasn't that you? Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, someone else in economics. Yeah, it was Dex, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, and uh, but taking, I, I know my uncle, he would lot, uh, he throw them away, but he would lay, lay, out, lay out all the waste um, in a field and um, let it compost so that he could use it as fertilizer. So it wasn't actually totally being right. Probably some animals got to eat. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Probably some deer, yeah. Um, That's but crazy, I guess too. that kind of ways, like, you, you know, sometimes you're, you're forced to do things in a way that you don't agree with, but there's sometimes can be a solution uh, that can be found out of that. Yeah, that's smart because he was doing what he had to do or committed to doing or whatever, but like he wasn't being completely wasteful, like putting yeah. a garbage bag and yeah. putting in a landfill. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about you know what we're doing here. So Conservancy is she or business? We work on behalf of our customers mainly in commercial real estate and the built environment. Um, to help with their ESG, environmental, social governance reporting, um, help them track their KPIs, energy, water, waste, and improve upon them, reduce carbon, et cetera. So um, with regards to the business or with regards to just ESG reporting with the lens on waste, I will say, um, you know, we've gotten better at energy. We've gotten better at water. Waste remains a wild card. It is very hard to report on waste, and customers want us to, right, for all the reasons that we're talking about. It's part of their regulatory reporting. It's part of their um, involuntary and voluntary reporting. Um, but there hasn't been any sort of standardization. So when we're talking about, um, you know, the, the invoice, the bill being the source of truth, um, we're talking about any which way formats. It's very hard. So I actually, I'm going to ask Dax to to speak about um, you know what WasteX does, how it helps kind of um, make this massive challenge a bit more approachable for for people that own or operate real estate that really want to dive in and see where they're at, draw that line in the sand, make a plan, improve um, you know, and get better with regards to where their waste is going. So, um, Dax, maybe you can explain what WasteX does to help help our customers do that better. Yep, awesome. Thanks, Healy. So WasteX really was formed um, a number of years ago because we just we saw that there was an issue um, and we wanted to help solve that for our clients. So really, WasteX is built off of the foundations of transparency. We want you to be able to see what's happening with waste at your property. 
Uh, waste is always one of those things that it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, you don't really pay much attention to it until it becomes a problem, you know, an eyesore for your residents, those types of issues. Um, so really waste X is driven off of transparency. We want you to see what's happening before it becomes a problem. One, we want to have a high level of customer support. So again, you don't have to worry about the waste um, for your property. And then we want to make data-driven decisions, right? Um, and so there's a number of different items that the WasteX product does. One is contract compliance. We're going to make sure that your billing and your invoicing is, is correct according to your contract. So you're not overpaying. Uh, but we also have what we call our waistline report. So we have, we have an algorithm that goes through and it, it projects the volume of waste that we would expect. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll also track if there's excess or contamination. Um, a lot of the times what we see is if people throw trash in the recycling, um, then you get fined for that. So what we try and do is we'll do tenant education around what can be recycled, what should be recycled, um, make sure you're breaking down cardboard boxes, really just trying to educate our residents on what waste and recycling is. Uh, we also have the contract negotiation piece. So we're going to go through and we'll make sure you get um, get a, a good rate with a good service level. We'll make sure you get a good hauler that's uh, continuing to show up when they're expected, as well as like you'd mentioned, uh, Healy, the, the data reporting for Cresp, for Energy Star. It's really difficult where waste bills, they don't have the metered utilities. I can't see my consumption data. Um, and so it makes it really difficult to do that reporting. So WasteX has come up with a way that we will work with the invoices, we'll work with the hauler, um, and we can actually determine what your uh, waste reporting is. And obviously we have a, a connection with the Gobi software, so it's fully integrated. And so um, by utilizing WasteX, it, it just really streamlines all of that sustainability reporting. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, it, it's hugely helpful to us because again, you know, with um, some of the other types of utilities, we can standardize a bit better. With waste, you know, you might get you might get a bill, but it might be for multiple properties, a campus, uncertain, unclear. You might get a statement. You might get an Excel sheet. You might get a handwritten, um, you know, paper, piece of paper. So when you're trying to make sense of that all, um, you know, what we're trying to do, certainly with the Gobi technology as part of Conservice ESG, is automate whatever we can. You know, take the human error, the human element out of it, um, be able to process KPI data, energy, water waste for portfolios of thousands of buildings, where if you try to do that by hand, it's just prohibitive by time. It's just not possible. But waste is it's just really hard to automate because, you know, of those reasons. So hopefully as these things go, if the regulation picks up um, and they try to standardize on those kinds of things and someone decides it's important and the economics, the unit economics have to make sense. As, as soon as someone decides to make plastic expensive, you know, then we'll then we'll deal with it before there's a disaster. But until that happens, it's just um, people are still driven by what they're driven by. Um, but for the people on this podcast today who are, you know, motivated by other altruistic um, altruistic motives, I suppose. So, yeah, I, I would say the systems that currently exist around around waste, you know, they're, aren't, they're not well established. You know, this is with WasteX, that's the first. Um, you know, version of a solution that I've actually heard that me too. Know, Never heard yeah. of it. That's, yeah, um, that's amazing that you're able to get that information because, you know, like you said, like most waste, um, you know, most municipalities, uh, contracts, whatever, they're not tracking that. Um, so to have a solution, um, you know, that's really that's really incredible. It's, it sounds like one of the first ones like I've heard. So yeah, yeah, yeah and we beat the. Oh, go ahead, Doug. I was going to say, it's been a lot of fun just because we we do have a solution that really helps alleviate those pain points. Um, the other piece that I find really, really fun, really engaging is, is we work with our, our, you know, our clients and our partners. Um, they have some real goals that they want to hit around waste, whether that be that diversion. We have another goal that they're, they want to get recycling on every property. And so obviously um, it needs to be cost effective and as they roll this out. And so really taking kind of a consultant approach to it and saying, okay, how do we solve this puzzle? And that's really what it is. Sometimes it's just a big jigsaw puzzle that we need to figure out what's the best way to tackle this problem. Uh, and, and I mean, it's, it's trash, it's waste, but it's actually a lot of fun too. Like it. 
So as we, a uh, good, robust conversation today, I think people on this podcast are certainly passionate about it. I didn't actually know that I was passionate about waste until I did this podcast, but apparently I am. Um, <laughs> so if we go around the, the room quickly, um, parting thoughts. Uh, where do we want to leave the audience today? Adam, what's your parting thought? Well, I, I'll just say I love what Dex said about um, you know bringing that transparency and and I, in my head too, like in the food uh, or my fridge. Okay, keeping an inventory. What do I have? So I think just knowing what you have, valuing what you have, and then you can see all right where can I make improvements, um, whether it's your fridge or your building. Um, there's just so much opportunity. So. I guess one man's trash is another man's treasure is my I like it. famous last words. <laughs> uh, Heidi, what do you think? What's your parting thought? Well, I'm not going to have a catchphrase like Adam, but <laughs> I, uh, I would say having these conversations um, and just having, like, discussing what we all think is important, you know, is, I think that, that kind of pushes, you know, it pushes the, the narrative on, on why we need to work on waste, you know, what kind of solutions are out there. I think it's something that we all need to kind of work together, um, you know, as a global community to solve. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the more you talk about something, the more it gets on, you know, the minds of, you know, people in this industry and, okay, this is becoming important to our consumers. You know, we need to make moves on this. So I think just having that conversation, keeping it, keeping it front and front and center. You know, maybe there's not a lot that we can individually do to manage this, but I think together talking about it, making it um, making it important, you know, is, is uh, a big deal. I like it. I agree. Um, Dax, what do you think? So I'm going to piggyback off of Heidi's. I'm going to say let's continue to have the conversations around this, but let's not let this be a New Year's resolution type of conversation. Let's set some goals around it, some objectives, and actually make it happen. Um, we don't have to hit a home run on this, you know, the first swing. If we can get 1% better today, then that's the right step. So it's just taking so a baby step and moving in the right direction. So true. It's such a crawl, walk, run. And even before the crawl, to Heidi's point, it's like awareness. It's just letting people know that this is bad. And that is a good um, segue into my parting thought, which is um, you can't be aware about it. Uh, start young you know, teach small children what to do so it just becomes habit. It's not something you think about. You just do it. If you didn't start young, start now. Start today. Do something different. Um, pay attention to what you're recycling. Get involved. Try to eat the leftovers before they spoil. Try to make sure you donate the food you're not using. Think about the end of life. Um, and, of course, lastly, don't buy cheap crap from overseas. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's useless and disposable. Think of creative ways. That's a challenge to myself. Creative way, um, an alternative goodie bag that will still be cool and fun um, and won't embarrass my children, but also won't cause you know so much useless waste and carbon footprint. So, um, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much. This flew by because it was so interesting. Um, appreciate you joining us on the ESG Experience podcast. There is a new episode every month, so if you enjoyed your time with us, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. Stay tuned for our next episode where we'll be looking at ways that strategic investing can help fight climate change. Um, we appreciate our loyal subscribers for continuing to listen and support our podcast. And if you do want to continue the conversation between episodes and a month is too long for you to wait till the next release, uh, do follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG experience. Um, and have a great day, guys. We appreciate it. Appreciate you joining. Thanks, everyone.